The 5820K is an oddball of sorts. It's the first time Intel's released a 6-core, 12-threaded CPU as an entry-level CPU in their enthusiast platform. Coming in at $400, this may certainly seem like compelling value for money. Or is it? Let's find out today. So with practically every other reviewer out there reviewing the 5960X, that's the 8 core 16 threaded beast, I took it upon myself to get the value option, the $400 5820K. Now this is a 6 core 12 threaded CPU that comes clocked in at 3.3 gigs base with a 3.6 gig turbo clock. The cache ratio also comes in clocked at 3 gigahertz, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in the conclusion overclocking. However, the only disadvantage of this CPU really is that it has 28 PCIe lanes versus its bigger brother, the 5930K, which has 40 PCIe lanes. However, you do pay on average a $200 premium for those extra lanes. And on a good note, it does have an extra 12 lanes over the little brother, the 4790K. So this does have a place in the market. However, another disadvantage of this is that you will have to get the pricey X99 platform, as well as the currently newly released DDR4 memory, which also will set you back quite a bit of money. So with those two things aside, is this CPU good value for money? Let's move on now to the benchmarks, where I'll be benchmarking this in games, productivity benchmarks, I'll be testing power consumption, and then we'll move on to a conclusion where I talk about overclocking as well. So let's move on now to the benchmarks where I've tested gaming, boot times, productivity, power consumption. So there's so much juicy stuff here. And this CPU was clocked at 4.2 gigs, that's a 5820K. And I compared it against a 4670K, which was clocked at 4.6 gigs. Now, the reason I did this is because I believe that's about the fair difference between them. I do believe on average a four core will go higher than a six or an eight core. And it was reflected in the voltages. Ultimately, this was at 1.24 volt and my 4670K was at 1.24. 5, 5 volts are so very similar the ram speeds i'll put that in the description below but the 4670k was clocked at 2 gigs the memory and the 5820k i decided to leave that on the default of 2133 as i'll be doing a review on the ddr4 memory for crucial very soon but let's move on now to the gaming benchmarks battlefield 4 1080p ultra the test range uh, this managed. This was actually an interesting benchmark. We managed to see the 5820K pull a victory, a clear victory here, with 187.92 frames per second average versus the 4670K average frames per second of 168.08. I also tested this on Windows 8 as well, both CPUs. Uh, as opposed to Windows 7, which I've done a lot of my previous testing on. And the reason was I had the, I already said that the 5820K kind of clonked out. But let's move on now to Crisis 3 uh, 1080p Ultra. And this was done with 59.28 frames per second versus 58.92. So in Crisis 3 on the 5820K versus the 4670K, there was virtually no difference at all. So if you were buying this 5820K for extra Crisis 3 <laughs> speeds, you'd be in bad luck. But anyway, let's move on now to Skyrim, one game that I was actually very curious to see the results for, because this is a game that relies on not just RAM speeds, it relies on CPU cache and CPU clock speeds. It's very intense on all those three things. And this just showed it. I mean, this CPU was clocked 400 megahertz lower uh, and it scored 175.08 frames per second versus 168.52 on the 4670K. So it's clocked lower, but it's scoring a higher, um, it's scoring a higher score. And I think this mainly has to do with the extra CPU cache. It has a lot more CPU cache on board than the 4670K. So that just proved that. that as a really good, I really enjoyed doing that benchmark. Uh, moving on now to Armor 3 1080p Ultra. This benchmark was interesting because the 4670K scored a clear victory here being um, 73.56, frames per second, average frames per second on the 5820K versus 78.84 frames per second on the 4670K. So, wow, the, um, I mean, the 5820K lost here. So Armor 3 is clearly clock speed dependent on fewer cores. So it's not optimized for those multi-threaded CPUs. Well, it is, I guess, four core, optimized for four cores. But anyway, let's move on now to some 1440p benchmarks. Battlefield 4, 124 frames per second on the 5820K versus the 4670K, which scored 110. So there was another clear victory at 1440p. This game clearly loves those multi-threaded CPUs, and it's clearly optimized for them as well. Uh, let's move on now to Crisis 3, 1440p Ultra. We had here 38.16 frames per second versus 37.68. Again, absolutely nothing between these two CPUs in Crisis 3. Uh, let's move on now to some productivity 
productivity benchmarks. Adobe Premiere Pro CS6. This was with my GDX 970 and ultimately this was the Mercury engine was enabled. So I wanted this to reflect real world conditions. And we see here the 5820K scored a clear victory. It was a big victory over the 4670K coming in at 491 seconds. This was to render, I think this was rendering a... Ooh, it was a nine minute video with a 50 megabit per second bit rate with a max of 100 megabits per second. Uh, the 4670K lost by quite a bit, coming in at 737 seconds. Uh, looking at Prozonus, I decided to do a music benchmark for some of those people who do a lot of mixing and stuff like that. Uh, even though I had no idea what I was doing, I just got a trial. I pretty much made this 3 minute and 30 second copy paste track. And then I just decided to mix it down and I decided to get some recording or scores and times on the mix down. The time it took to make the mix down. So the 5820K scored 6.232 seconds versus the 4670K which came in at 12.05 seconds. So a big victory for the 5820K here, especially for those people who do music production. So the next benchmark is WinRAR. This is this time around I decided to do a massive 15.5 gigabyte file on both 64-bit versions of WinRAR and the 5820K scored 611 seconds to archive the file on normal compression and the 4670K took 1187 seconds. So this was a big victory for the 5820K in WinRAR as well. Uh, Cinebench, this was the next interesting benchmark, R15. The 5820K came uh, miles ahead of the 4670K coming in at 1212 points. Contrast this to the 4670K that came in at 697 points. So Cinebench clearly was a victory for the 5820K by a big shot. So uh, let's look at boot times now. Boot times of 5820K actually lost to the 4670K coming in at 28.92 seconds versus the 4670K which booted up in 24.84 seconds. So Windows 8, it loves fast clock speeds for boot times. That's something to take note there and that's something I learned for my learnt myself with this benchmark. Now, power consumption. Before I managed to reinstall Windows, I disabled hyperthreading on Prime 95 because if I had it enabled, the power consumption went through the roof. It was like going up to 430 watts, 440 watts. However, uh, with hyperthreading disabled, I thought it was more realistic versus the 4670K. And we see it still comes in at a massive 125 watts extra power. This is clocked 400 megahertz lower and it was just getting, I mean, it was just consuming power like a beast. I mean, the, the 4670K, when I clocked that at 4.2 gigs, that went all the way down to 220 watts. So clock for clock, I mean, the 4670K was a lot more power efficient, like a lot more power efficient. This thing just, the, the, I mean, the 5820K chewed power. And that was with hyperthreading disabled. So that was, I mean, this platform is one hell of a power chewing machine. Uh, looking at the idle uh, temps here, I mean, the idle wattage here, 133 versus 98. So that's actually pretty good uh, considering the extra cores and the fact that the 4670K goes all the way down to 800 megahertz, whereas the 5820K only goes down to 1200 minimum clock speeds. And you've got to factor in the X99 also has a lot more stuff on board the motherboard. So anyway, let's, there's the benchmarks done. Let's move on now to a conclusion. So this is the conclusion, the part where I give you guys my thoughts and opinions on the 5820K. And ultimately it boils down to one question. What are you looking for in a CPU? If you're a gamer and you're just gaming on one high-end graphics card or even two mid to high range graphics cards then this cpu is going to be a complete waste of f***ing money like seriously if you have a 4770k or uh, 4790k you're going to save money not only on the cpu but you're going to save money on the x on the platform you can get a z97 motherboard which comes in a lot cheaper than an x99 you can also get ddr3 memory which doesn't really make a difference for games uh, and then you've got the power consumption. This thing used up a crap load more of power, power than the uh, 4670K did. I mean, this was in Prime 95, but even when I was gaming, I tested out a few games. When I was gaming, I looked down at my power meter and I clearly saw that this thing was using up a lot more than my 4670K ever did. So I wish, I mean, I wish Intel would kind of copy Toyota and put some variable valve timing in this CPU. <laughs> 
that would be a cool feature, but I don't think that's going to come in the near future anyway. So yeah, basically the for a gamer, I mean, especially one on just a budget, this CPU and the platform is not really for you. However, let's look at now the productivity benchmarks. We saw that this thing absolutely kicked the living shit out of the 4670K. It was a no comparison. So if you're on a budget, oh, I guess if you're on a productivity budget if you're going for a workstation an entry-level workstation then this thing makes a lot of sense i mean it really did uh, especially premiere pro and unzipping things and just making music and cinebench it really proved that it is a cpu ready to do the workload required of it so it really is one hell of a cpu for productivity uh, yes, it does use extra power, but it does so with results when it comes to productivity. Uh, also, one thing you've got is the 20, uh, 28 PCIe lanes on this CPU. And it kind of puts it in a unique position where it's in between the 5930K and the 4790K. And I mean, ultimately, the 4790K, if all you're doing is making a couple of videos here and there, or making music here and there, the 4790K is still going to be a wonderful buy, even the 4690K. But if you're working all the time and time is money, then this thing's going to be a great buy, or even the 8-core 16 thread's going to be an 8-buy. However, this thing can't do what the 5930K or the 8-core can do, because it doesn't have as many PCIe lanes. But what it does have over the 4-core is especially an extra 8 lanes. So you can put a, say, a high-end graphics card like a Tesla, and then you can have another graphics card, so you can have that at 16 speed or in a 16 speed PCIe slot, and then you can have another graphics card for all your monitors, uh, maybe a Quadro for all your monitors, and you'll have one beast setup, and that will allow you to do that. This this CPU will allow you to do that. However, if you're looking for the best possible uh, render times, then obviously you're going to go with the 8 core, and that has the 40 PCIe lanes anyway. So I actually kind of in hind, I mean in in closing, I actually like where this CPU is placed. I think it's great that Intel's offering more options like this, and I was actually kind of impressed with the Pentium as well, the G3258, the fact that they allowed people to overclock it on a cheap motherboard. That was really good as well. Uh, obviously, the X99 is expensive. That's something that can't be helped. I mean, when I'm going to do, give you guys a review of the MSI X99 very soon. And honestly, for the money, it's feature-packed. It is, when I opened it out of the box, it was a heavy motherboard, and it just came feature-packed. I was actually very impressed with the X99 motherboard. The memory, the DDR4 memory, that's just how it is. It runs cooler, it uses less power, and it's higher speeds than DDR3. So you can't really expect the prices of that to come down anytime soon. But uh, yeah, those two extra costs are associated with this CPU, so keep that in mind. Even though this thing looks good on the surface and for productivity it's great, it still comes with those extra costs. So yeah, that's it guys. Uh, if you enjoyed this review of the 5820K, please leave, uh, please give it a thumbs up. It took me a long time to do. I'll be getting a DDR4 memory review done for Crucial very soon, and I'll be giving some tutorials and stuff like that, and the MSI motherboard review, that's coming very soon. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, this CPU is kind of a bit of a mixed bag, I guess. If you're Also, I guess one more thing I left out is the temps and how it overclocked as well. This CPU overclocked um, pretty really mediocre. I mean, I thought maybe I had a below average chip. I mean, I got to 4.5 gigs, and I looked at the power consumption. I immediately restarted my computer. I'm like, this 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 overclock isn't for me. Like, it was drawing like almost near 500 watts on Prime 95. This was only the CPU before I even kicked in the graphics card. And I was like, no way. I'm not using this CPU with that much wattage from the wall. So the diminishing returns really kicks in after 1.2 watts, as opposed to the 4670K where your diminishing returns kicks in after about 1.25 volt. So the 4670K will be, or the four cores will be better for overclocking than these eight cores or the six cores will be. That just can't be helped. They're bigger cores, they leak more. Uh, also, the temps of the motherboard, the MSI motherboard, held up perfectly fine with this CPU. And on the sweet spot overclock of 4.2 gigs on this CPU, the Animax T40 did a fantastic job as well. So kudos to both MSI and Animax. And also crucial as well, that memory is running so cool. And I've actually been playing around with it and overclocking it, and it overclocks like a beast. So that's one thing as well. Also, one thing I forgot to mention is the cache ratio as well on this CPU. is clocked at 3.6 gig. And it was surprised because I couldn't get it any higher than 3.6 gig. And when you look at the um, other specs of the 5930K and the 5960X, you see that 
basically they've got the same cache ratio speeds as the clock speeds this one comes in 300 megahertz lower by default it comes in at three gig clock speed on the cache ratio whereas opposed to the normal clock speeds go up to 3.6 gig turbo so there's something going on with the cpu where the cache um, is maybe severely um, I guess inferior to the 5930k or the 5960x and I couldn't get mine to pass uh, 3.6 gig no matter what I did and I was absolutely surprised because the uh, 4670k goes up to 4.1 no problems so something's going on with the cache ratio there and an interesting thing with the cache ratio is when you overclock that and you give it more voltage it actually uses up a bit more power too. I managed from three gigs to 3.6, it used up an extra 20 watts in Prime 95, whereas opposed to my 4670K, it used up nothing. Like I, probably, I could probably attribute two or three watts. So there's something going on with the cache ratio with the CPU. I recommend, ultimately I've got mine at 3.3 gigs, a little bit of a uh, overclock there on it, a little bit of a tweak. And so I'll be coming out with an overclocking tutorial for this thing very soon, as I've already learned its behavior and how it behaves. Uh, but yeah, for me personally, you guys know that I am a gamer and I produce a lot of, I guess I'm starting to produce a lot of content. So I guess, I mean, at first I was really unimpressed with this CPU. I was like, damn, I wasted my money. But I'm actually, the more I use it, the more I start to like it. It is a beast. And I mean, it does anything that I can throw at it. So I'm left, I'm left at the moment with the sort of like a, you know, I'll give it yeah mid-range score. So uh, can I recommend it for people? Yeah, even if they're a gamer, I guess, looking to upgrade in the future, maybe, I don't know. I mean, I wish, honestly, I wish this thing had 32 PCIe lanes. That would make it a really good um, killing blow for those gamers who want to get two graphics cards and just go balls to the walls, like when, you know, two really ridiculously high-speed graphics cards come out. So that'd be really cool if they did enable... 16 speed on both the PCI Express 1 and 2 ports. That's my only shame. I mean, I just wish it had 32. But anyway, that's about it from me, guys. I hope you enjoyed this review. And if you haven't already, uh, hit the like button, please. It took me a long time, like I said before. And if you haven't already, subscribe to Tech Yes City, and I'll catch you guys with a tech video very shortly. Peace out for now. Bye.